Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Mullen, and I work with the Notre Dame Sisters in Communications right here in Omaha, Nebraska. And we are so incredibly lucky today because we get to speak with Sister Marianne Zimmer, who many of us don't get to see that often. Sister Marianne lives in Pennsylvania. She is a professor of religious studies, and we are going to have a great conversation today about what it's like to be a professor um, in this day and age, both with the coronavirus and, of course, um, with all of the social justice demonstrations happening around the country. So let me bring in Sister Marianne. Good morning, Sister. Hi, Molly. How are you? I'm good. How is it in Pennsylvania? Uh, humid. So it's not too hot yet today, but the humidity is very, very thick. Well, you haven't gotten any rain respite like we have here? Uh, we have short dribbles of rain almost every day and then every once in a while we'll have a storm but never like a nebraska storm that's that's got to be something that you miss living in pennsylvania yeah, yeah. it's my favorite weather so <laughs> for those people who are watching who may not know you very well can you give a quick little background about yourself um i was born and raised in omaha and i have five brothers and a sister and they're kind of scattered around now um, i went to Holy Angels Grade School, which has been run over by the, the highway and Notre Dame Academy. And then I went to Duchenne and Creighton for a, a degree in theology. And then I've gradually added to that until I've gotten to the PhD level and can teach. So I've taught everything but from little people all the way up through uh, average parishioners up to students who are coming in as freshmen. Uh, and you've written a college textbook, haven't you? Um, I've written a little book called uh, Mary, Tradition, and <laughs> I forget the other word for it. <laughs> Tradition and Devotion, I think, are the two words we decided on. Uh, and that's that's been really fun because uh, I can give it to people who know nothing about Mary, and it doesn't tell you why you should love Mary or uh, sort of the things that you get in a devo devotional book, but it tells you how she came to to occupy the theological place that she occupies in, in Catholicism. So it's it's an unusual approach. And I've had some people write into Amazon reviews that say, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And then other That's people, what I'm for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is a good thing, really, because it, it's different than what most people have uh, read. So I enjoyed writing that a great deal because I like making complicated things make sense to people. So tell people about your current teaching ministry. Um, I'm at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and we've just broken out bumper stickers that say, yes, Scranton is a real place. Because a lot of people think the whole thing is imaginary. Yeah, that, that it's like Scranton is real. The office is imaginary. But not everybody. Like the only things I know about Scranton, Pennsylvania, come from the office. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Are you going to put the bumper sticker on your car? Um, I don't think so. I'll, uh, it's more effective to do it in person. Because <laughs> so, all the people that would see my car know it's a real place. How long have you been uh, at this university and what do you teach currently? Uh, I've been here 11 years, 12 years. And Currently, I'm teaching uh, Introduction to the Bible. Sometimes I teach it online in the summer. Sometimes I teach it uh, during the semester. And then uh, occasionally I teach it during the semester online with sisters who live in Africa. So it's uh, Zambia, Kenya, and Uganda are in the particular cluster where I teach. So has teaching changed for you in light of the coronavirus or is it mostly the same because you're used to teaching online? Um, no, it, it's different teaching online to the sisters because most of them have at least seen a Bible and are familiar with some of the contents. Whereas when I teach it here to undergraduates, uh, there are always people in the course who have never held a Bible or who are completely without any relationship to a church community. So it, they don't know the story at all. So there's, 
and then there are people who have been to like Lutheran Sunday school and know everything. So it's complicated to have all those people in one class because you've got to do enough background to to bring the people up to speed who have no background, but you can't bore the ones that already know the storyline. Do you, is that what makes it exciting is having all these different uh, levels of knowledge and interest in the same room? I like it, yeah. And one of the things I always do in that class is give them a spectrum of um, people's interpretation of inspiration. So, Many people believe that God had something to do with the writing of the Bible. But what that means to different people is something completely different. And then you've got people who read the Bible as literature. Like there are PhDs in, in Bible who have no consideration that the Bible has anything to do with God. It's like literature, literature. Um, so there's that secular all the way up to the people that think the Bible teaches history and science. And so, it helps the students to see that there's a spread of ways of thinking about it and you don't have to be either completely literal about it or completely secular that that there are ways of seeing it as uh conveying information about religion that that you want to know but it doesn't have to be literal so how have the classroom dynamics or these conversations changed in light of teaching um online this last semester due to the virus uh, it was kind of crazy because we only had a couple weeks to get ready to do it. So uh, the students were not thinking about it being an online course and we were just kind of trying to keep everything afloat. Uh, so it was a difficult semester, I think, for everybody. But next semester we're going to we're going to start out in the classroom. I think we're going to end up online at some point. Um, but we're spending the summer training faculty to be good online teachers because there wasn't any time for that in March. Well, somebody who's taught online before, um, even if it's to, to sisters instead of freshmen, what, uh, what advice do you have for, for those many, many teachers who are going to be teaching online this summer or this fall? Uh, I think probably the biggest thing is to stay in touch with the students. So to um, to respond to them, to find out who they are and what's important to them. Sometimes I have them, no, this doesn't work so well with the sisters, but uh, I have the students introduce themselves in terms of the pets they have or the pets they wish they had uh, because it really humanizes them to each other. And I have a pet, so that kind of breaks down some barriers with them there too. You have a pet? I have a cat. Yeah. What is his or her name? It's <laughs> her name is Princess, Her Highness Princess. I got her out from under a bush. That <laughs> some of the faculty or some of the staff at Marywood found her, and she needed a home. Uh, so they called her. Her Royal Highness Princess Fufu, I think, is what. <laughs> is she allowed to come see her? Um, she doesn't like to be picked up. Um, Me neither. She's a, a very independent cat. Well, and she was feral, so she's not. Um, she wasn't used to being handled from the time she was born. Right. So she's a little. I'm trying to take her to the vet, but I can't catch her. Well, speaking of teaching, I wanted to ask some questions about teaching um, from a different perspective. I know this semester has been um, interesting because it's all online, but um, there's also just been this resurgence um, in demands for social justice across the country, especially in the light of the death of George Floyd um, and all of the other um, deaths that have precipitated after that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you've noticed or seen happening in Pennsylvania for those of us who don't live there? Uh, Pennsylvania, where I live, I, I live kind of in the far northeast corner. So there are two towns of, of some size here, but they're not very big. So Wilkes-Barre Wilkes is one and Scranton is the other. And uh, both of them have new, newly formed Black Lives Matter chapters. So 
um, that's that's sort of one branch. And then there's another organization called Showing Up for Racial Justice. And Showing Up for Racial Justice is advertises itself as for white people who want to do their part uh, in creating more social justice. So educating themselves, um, but not taking over the movement, but respecting black leadership. So and have black you attended any, any meetings, protests, rallies? Have you seen anything in person or on the news? Yeah, I was down at our courthouse square um, short, shortly after uh, George Floyd was killed. And there was quite a good crowd for a small place like Scranton and a relatively conservative place. place. And then about two weeks later, there were a thousand people at the courthouse square um, rallying for a Black Lives Matter group. And it was a very mixed race group and lots and lots of young people. And why did you feel as um, a sister or as a person or as a neighbor or as a theologian, why did you think it was important for you to physically show up to one of these rallies? Um, it's important to me, I think, to witness that uh, as a white person, I take responsibility for, for the problem. It's, it's like people of color didn't create this situation for themselves. It's held in place by white privilege. And um, I think I should use that privilege to do some kind of, of intervention or witnessing or um, action. And so uh, at the same time those things were happening, one of our students who had graduated started an online petition that, that Marywood should have a required course in African American history. That they felt that they had gotten out of college without knowing. They were they were utterly shocked about things like um, the Tulsa massacre in 1921. They have you know had never heard of it. Um, well, you know as well as I do, there are many people in Omaha that don't know about our very famous lynching of 1921 either. You don't yeah. know what you weren't taught, right? So. Uh, there were maybe 500 people that signed that petition. I don't remember the exact number. I think they started out looking for maybe 200 and it went way over. Um, so one of the things, the cat is messing with the drapes. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm spending time on right now is we were already in the process of redoing the syllabus for our uh, introductory religious studies course. So as part of that syllabus, now we're figuring out what we can uh, cover in the way of racial justice in that particular course. And what I found so fascinating, what you said yesterday, and I loved your words, was that um, you teach about race in all of your courses, um, theology or, or otherwise, because what you said was um, you have to knowingly omit a conversation about race and racism because it's pervasive through all coursework and throughout life. Is that kind of what you said yesterday? Yeah, this summer I just started realizing I have um, always pursued how race is a part of what I'm teaching. So when I teach about church, I teach a book on black church, black, black Catholic church experience in the United States. And that's Can always- you know the, a bit more about this and about teaching about this book specifically? Um, the book has, kind of a range of topics. And the ones that the students find most interesting are one very complicated chapter on the founding of the Sisters of Divine Providence in Baltimore. And this was in the early 1800s. And they were black women. And so they had a great deal of trouble getting somebody to be their chaplain to come and say mass at their convent. They had a lot of trouble with people accepting the fact, the fact that they weren't going to be servants. They weren't there to clean the seminary, that they were, they were teachers and they were teaching black children. So uh, they, they really, really struggled. And one of the things that students learn from reading that is that 
some of the people who, who gave them a lot of problems were priests. And it's kind of uh, startling to the students um, that a priest would teach a group of sisters so badly. <laughs> it just, um, they, they really suffered trying to get started. And what kind of conversations happen with 19 and 20 year olds around this topic? They, they don't have a lot of words for it. It's more feeling shocked and um, feeling surprised and a certain amount of empathy. And, and were you involved in social justice at their age, either at Creighton or, or at um, Notre Dame Academy or Duchenne? Um, when I was at, at Notre Dame, uh, there was an organization called uh, Young Christian Students. And it was modeled on uh, some organizations in Europe for young Christian workers. And it was partly a, a labor movement, but it taught you that uh, as a layperson in the church, you could look around and analyze your situation. You could see what the gospel would say to, about it, and then you would plan how you were going to intervene. So that was, you know, I was 14 <laughs> when we started that. Uh, so that was always a part of my uh, growing up as a, a Notre Dame. So, and do you, do you see students now also engaging in social justice? Do you see that interest in students at your university or in Scranton? They're very interested in service. That, that kind of makes sense to them. Uh, they need education on social justice just to be able to analyze what creates oppression, what might mitigate it. Uh, so every once in a while, I'll run into a student who nobody in their whole environment talks like this. And so they already are formed to think that the poor are just lazy or somebody who's on welfare is really cheating the system or, but it's so deep in their at, the atmosphere they've grown up in. Um, but some of them are like, nobody I know has ever talked like this. I got to think about this. So some managed to come to it with a very fresh eye. So it's nice to see them doing that. So there's a lot of, um, there's always a lot of negative attitude from one generation to the younger generation. Do you see, or are you optimistic about the, the students that you have and the, the generation that you teach? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I think that they have, um, they're gonna have more complicated lives than the rest of us, I think, because uh, growing up with so many threats from uh, terrorism and coronavirus and uh, not being able to find a job and some of those things that people pretty much took for granted. You go to college, you get a degree, you get a job. And some for a number of them, that's not happening. Uh, so I think they have a tough road to hold, but they're also creative and energetic. And my final question before I let you go to your next meeting, I know you're a very busy woman. Um, what else um, in this time, you know, things are crazy with the pandemic and with, with social justice problems and, you know, issues at the border and on and on and on. What what gives you hope uh, in, in these days and times? I get a lot of hope for the number of people that are participating in Black Lives Matter. Uh, it seems to have it seems to have gone from sort of a marginal disrespected, suspicious raising group uh, to something mainstream that people realize needs needs to exist and that they they need to put some energy into it. So it'll be curious to see you know how that plays out. but we're very busy at uh, Marywood working it into the curriculum. Well, I'm so grateful for professors like you, and I'm so grateful for your co-workers who are ready and willing to take this on and discuss it with young people. Um, thank you so much for being with me here today. Well, thank you, Molly. Um, for those alums, feel free to send emails or contact Sister Marianne. She missed our reunion, so um, she needs to hear from you. Thank you for those of you um, who commented, Sister Marianne. I hope that you can see those great comments. Um, 
And we'll be back here next week at 1030 with another great Notre Dame sister. So be safe, be well. Thank you so much, Sister Marianne. Thanks for having me, Molly. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for watching. Join us here next week when we're gonna be here at 10.30 a.m. Wednesday um, with another great sister. I haven't uh, found out who I'm interviewing yet, but I know it'll be a fantastic conversation. Thank you for your comments and we'll be seeing you soon.